first philosopher is Professor uh, Jim Wetherill. Jim's a professor of logic and philosophy of science at the University of California, Irvine. He holds a PhD in physics from the Stevens Institute of Technology, as well as a PhD in philosophy from uh, UCI. He works on a broad range of areas in the philosophy of physics and the philosophy of science, including uh, mathematical conceptual foundations of classical and quantum field theory, uh, even uh, model building and finance. He also has interest in uh, category theory and foundations of mathematics and atomic theory and <coughs> control theory. Uh, we had the pleasure yesterday of hearing him uh, chat to us about the black hole information paradox. He has a recent paper on this, which you should not just cite but also read. Uh, and, uh, and today he's going to tell us about. I'm comfortable. I mean, you know, I'll take what I can get. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was going to be one, one that he was from. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Sorry. With, yeah. That's right. So he did his undergraduate degree here at Harvard, so some of you already know him. Uh, and today he's going to tell us about the, the motion of small bodies in space time. Uh, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> this is a. Uh, um, a, a tough act to follow, of course, um, and so uh, thank you, Malcolm and, and Andy, for um, those reflections. And this is, I'm afraid, something completely different. Um, okay, so I should begin by acknowledging uh, my um, collaborator on this, who is uh, Bob Garrosh, who's a, a physicist in some sense. Um, uh, based in Chicago, who mostly lives in the woods in Wyoming now. <laughs> so, the question that um, I'm going to address is an, an old one in Foundations of General Relativity. It's how do small bodies move in the theory? Um, or how do how does small bodies move according to general relativity? And of course there's an immediate answer, which is that, well, any textbook in general relativity will tell you that free massive point particles traverse time like geodesics, and light rays traverse null geodesics. Now, that answer um, is, of course, well known. It's, it's widely discussed. I'm not going to in any way contradict it. Um, nonetheless, there's a, a long history of people <coughs> who have uh, sought to say more about this problem. In particular, um, beginning very early in the history of the theory, it seems that Einstein and Eddington had the idea that um, the geodesic principle ought not to be some independent principle of general relativity. It ought to follow from other principles of the theory. There should be some sense in which, given Einstein's <laughs> equation, given um, some general principles concerning what physically reasonable matter in the theory is like, that one should be able to somehow derive the geodesic principle or prove the geodesic principle as a theorem. Um, and many people over the course of the last century have worked on this. Uh, you probably recognize some of them. There's Harvard villain <coughs> Shlomo Sternberg, um, who did important work on this in the 80s, 1990s. There's Bob Walls, of course. Um, yeah, but isn't it just the result of I mean, everything boils to quantum mechanics, the, the minimizing the path is not the least action. I mean, the so, let me, let me come back to this. So, um, yeah, uh, let, me, let me come back to that. I, so, I think you'll see what I'm trying to do, and then if that's not so clear, then I will uh, say why I wouldn't find that. I, I want to begin, though, before saying anything else about why I'm interested in this. I can't speak for why Bob is interested in this. He's been interested in this since 1970-something or other. Um, I'm interested in this because of a sort of broader philosophical question concerning what it means to say that space-time has a particular geometry. Um, this is something that philosophers have been interested in a long t for a long time, in what sense space does or must have a particular geometry. In the 20th century, this has become a question about space-time. Um, various people have argued that it's a matter of convention, whether you attribute some geometrical structure to space or to space-time. Uh, others have argued that it's somehow a, something that we've learned in the course of doing physics. Um, one of the ways in which geometry seems to immediately manifest in physics, I and mean, one of the ways in which we talk about what it means to say space-time is curved in general relativity is to talk about the behavior of certain kinds of uh, idealized measuring instruments, 
um, the, the behavior of rods and clocks, say, or somewhat more um, <coughs> mathematically, uh, attractively, the behavior of small bodies and light rays. Um, in fact, there's a, a theorem that goes back to Hermann Weyl in 1918 that uh, captures a sense in which the motion of small bodies um, fully encodes all of the metrical information in a space-time. So one way of understanding what it means to say that space-time is curved is to say that force-free motion has a certain character, that small, massive bodies follow time like geodesics, and light rays follow null geodesics. And so there's a link here between this kind of characteristic motion of small bodies, um, of inertial motion, and curvature of space-time. But of course it's the case that you don't get to just specify how small bodies move. Small bodies presumably are a special case of bodies more generally. We have differential equations that govern how bodies move quite generally, how fields evolve. You would like it to be the case that the evolution equations, the governing matter, um, tell us that in fact in a small body limit, things do follow time like geodesics. But now you have the question of, well, what does it mean? I mean, how is it that we get that conclusion by um, starting with matter field equations? What has to be true of those matter field equations for it to be the case that in a suitable small body limit um, is going to turn out that uh, sort of small versions of bodies constructed of that matter do follow time like geodesics, or if their charge follow Lorentz force curves, or they have various other forces impressed on them follow appropriate uh, trajectories. Um, and so that's how I get to this question. I'm trying to answer that motivated by the question of what it means in the first place to say that space-time has a particular geometrical structure. Okay, and so what I'm going to do to begin with is describe two general approaches that have been um, prominent in this literature uh, over the last um, 40 years in particular. I'm going to argue why I, or I'm going to describe why I find them uh, not totally satisfactory. Um, I'm then going to present the, um, uh, sort of sketch some of the, the results that, that Bob and I have, and then um, say something about why all of this bears on that question I just gave a little speech about. Okay. So, two approaches. Um, one very straightforward, elegant, and simple approach to understanding small body motion and general relativity was first observed by Myron Matheson um, early in the history of the theory, but then has been developed subsequently by Suryav, Sternberg, Gulen, and many others. Um, and I think this is an idea that uh, occurs to many people very quickly. Well, let's just treat small bodies as basically delta functions supported on a curve. And in fact, one can prove that if you represent a small body by a symmetric distribution, I'm going to write TAB, which should be suggested, right? This is going to be a distributional stress energy field supported on a curve in some space time, MG. And you make some requirements. You suppose that this distribution be order zero, so basically it's a delta function and not a, dis a derivative of a delta function, or a derivative of a derivative of a delta function, and so on. And you require that it be divergence free. It follows that it has to have this particular form. Very simple, it's just a delta function times the unit tangent to the curve twice, times some parameter, which you might naturally interpret as a mass. Um, and moreover, it follows that gamma must be a geodesic. They're the only curves along which uh, uh, point particle like bodies, I mean, the, the represented by a distribution, can propagate are geodesics. You can add a kind of energy condition if you'd like to get that it would be a time like geodesic. Okay, this is a simple mathematical argument. Um, it generalizes very nicely to forces. You can use it to show, for instance, that charged bodies will follow the Lorentz force law. You can derive F equals MA using similar sorts of methods. These are all one or two line arguments. It's very nice. Um, but I want to argue that the situation is not totally satisfactory with this approach. Um, one concern is that we have this sort of technical assumption without which the whole program fails which is that TAB is order zero. And you might think, why in the world, I mean, I just I want something that's supported on a curve, why does it have to be a delta function? Why couldn't it be a derivative of a delta function defined on the curve? Um, and of course, you can define such, such distributions, and they don't, in general, follow geodesics. They can do anything you like. Um, 
In some sense, this is good because we don't actually expect spinning bodies, like bodies that have intrinsic spin in the small body limit to follow G of D6. And so this tells us that there are additional degrees of freedom. Um, I also want to say, though, that actually, although this looks like a, a somewhat physically obscure technical condition, it can be justified in an interesting way. Um, we can define a notion of an energy condition for a distribution. The way we do that is by considering what I'm going to call, so considering test fields that satisfy what I'm going to call a dual energy condition. Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take test fields that can be written as the sorts of things that I would feed to the stress energy to check whether or not it satisfies the dominant energy condition. So these are going to be uh, compactly supported smooth functions that can be written as a sum of symmetrized outer products of pairs of covariantly causal and covectors. We'll say that a distribution satisfies the dominant energy condition if for every such test field. If it satisfies the dual energy condition, then the action of the distributional stress energy on that test field. So, so if I'm not mistaken, that means you're restricting yourself to optimum levels of type mm -hmm. one stress energy. Is there a reason why you're doing that? It's just the dominant energy condition. Not just for optimum levels type one? I'm not, I'm not saying that big T can be written in anything like this way. I'm saying T acts on. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Okay, and then you get this nice little proposition. If T satisfies the dominant energy condition, then it's order zero. So one way of understanding what order zero is doing here is it's basically restricting attention to certain kind of positive energy uh, matter. Um, one curious thing then, given the remarks I made about um, uh, spin, spin curvature coupling, is that it, it seems to turn out then that in the distributional limit, uh, spin is incompatible with the dominant energy condition. Um, that concern can be addressed, but here are two other concerns that I think are harder to address. One is that, well look, realistic matter is generally represented by fields. These fields satisfy hyperbolic systems. And it's not really clear how to think of a solution to some hyperbolic system as being represented by an energy momentum distribution supported on a curve. The reason for this is, if it's going to be supported on a curve, you would expect the fields themselves to be somehow distributional and supported on a curve. But now we run into a standard problem, which is that you can't multiply distributions and get another distribution. So TAD is going to, in general, be quadratic in fields. So if the fields are distribution supported on a curve, and you try to write down the stress energy formula using those fields, you're going to get something that's not well defined. Um, of course, the same problem that you encounter in quantum field theory and curve space time if you try to define a stress energy in, um, using operator value distributions. But if I take, for example, electromagnetism and I solve Maxwell's equations uh, for a wave packet, in the limit where that wave packet is very small, I can solve it using uh, a gradient expansion. And, and this, the leading order solution is just governed by geometric objects. Uh huh. Right? So. So that What's lets you multiply it? distributions. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that, that that wave packet, that the evolution of, that, of the wave packet leading order is just governed by the geodesic equation. Uh -huh. And what about the next order? There'll be some dispersion. And the order after that? You, you can, show that they all you they can, all get small and they fall by the limit systematically. Uh, I don't know if that's <laughs> in my head, but this is, this is something that's in an MTW. Right? Perhaps in the pocket. So, again, let me show you how we do it. And Maybe, maybe you've solved the problem to your satisfaction. I'm telling you how I've solved it to mine. Um, okay, so here's a third concern about this. Um, there are difficulties understanding distributional solutions to Einstein's <coughs> equations. And so um, there are, there's a, a certain sense in which you can't have distributional sources in Einstein's equation that are supported at a point or on a curve or on a two-dimensional surface. On a three-dimensional surface, it seems it's okay, but talking about things supported on curves. Right? Okay, so here's a second approach that first appeared in the late 1970s, developed by um, Bob, um, Pong Su Yang, and Jurgen Ehlers, um, and others. Bob Wald has worked on this quite recently. Um, here you begin with a curve, and you consider smooth fields that are supported in small neighborhoods of that curve. These smooth fields are, again, going to represent stress energies in small bodies. <laughs> Um, you then prove theorems of the following form. So let gamma be a smooth time-like curve in some space-time. 
Suppose that in any neighborhood O of gamma, there exists a smooth, symmetric, divergence-free, non-vanishing tensor field TAB that satisfies the dominant energy condition and whose support lies in the neighborhood O. Then gamma is a GAD second. And so the basic picture is, if I, you give me a curve, and near that curve, I can construct matter fields that propagate along that curve as close to the curve as I like, and vanish outside some neighborhood of the curve for any neighborhood, no matter how small. Um, and I can do this in such a way that the TAB satisfies the dominant energy condition and is divergence free. It follows that the curve must be a GAD second. So the interpretation is supposed to be that the only curves along which arbitrarily small bodies can follow are uh, time like GAD seconds. Okay, so I like this approach. This approach is also very simple. Um, in some ways, it's more transparent, right? So it considers smooth stress energies, uh, which is a more direct relationship to uh, physical matter fields. Um, moreover, I, these I sorts of fields. I don't understand your uh, the statement there. The TI, the symmetric <coughs> terms are TID depends on TID. So these are not, so we're, we're fixing a space time. Well, you're fixing space time now. Yeah. Now, in, in fact, oh, wait, are you. How can you fix it? Because TID influences the, the, the metric term. Yeah, so, so we're considering uh, the small body limit. We're supposing that mass is small. And then you can ask the question in a way that in includes back reaction. And so what you do is you, you um, consider Einstein tensors that are sol you know, representing solutions uh, and um, require that they uh, converge in, that the metrics associated with those Einstein tensors converge in an appropriate topology to a fixed background metric. And you show that then, even if you allow for back reaction in the small body limit, you uh, uh, still get the result. That's oh, due to Ehlers and uh, Garrosh in 2004. <coughs> but again, I want to suggest that this situation is not totally satisfactory for different reasons. First, it turns out to be very difficult to generalize these sorts of results in a way that captures anything like the generality or, um, to my view, clarity of the uh, geodesic version, the force-free versions, to include forces. Um, and there's also a sense in which we still have a problem with realistic matter, and that is that, in general, if you give me some initial data for some hyperbolic system, and you let it evolve, it will not stay in an arbitrarily small neighborhood of a curve forever. It's going to spread out. Um, and so, in fact, I, you know, so for Maxwell, for instance, I could never make it stay in uh, a tube in such a way that it vanishes outside that tube forever. Okay, so it's not really clear how to think about these results as applying to uh, any kind of realistic matter, and then we already heard something about the optical limit. It's a striking fact, then, that we've got all these, this whole literature describing geodesic principle theorems, um, but one cannot simply apply those theorems to uh, show that in the optical limit, Maxwell fields follow null geodesic. So that seems to me to be an unsatisfactory situation. And in fact, you know, so Wald in his textbook, for instance, um, describes the garros yang theorem and says, look, this is great. We get, uh, we get small body motion as a theorem. And then you know, several chapters later, uh, doesn't simply invoke that theorem. It goes to some trouble to describe the sort of asymptotic way that it expands. But isn't it, isn't it true that the, uh, the moments of the distribution, even electromagnetism, for example, will follow a geodesic, right? The, the centroid is a distribution. Well, and that's as good as you can get. I mean, think about think about what happens if you have higher order distributions. That's fine, but but still, you know, as a crisp statement, the centroid does follow the geodesic. The centroid of what? Of the distribution. Of what distribution? Of the electromagnetic wave packet. So, so you're thinking of distribution in different sense. I'm not thinking about it as a you know mathematical distribution. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about just you know some distribution of energy and momentum that's smooth and regular. And so. That's the geometric optics argument. But so that's going to hold in some limit with some assumptions, right? I mean, so this is small wavelength, big wavelength limit, high frequency. But you're never going to be able to get it to stay stay tight forever. Same thing with the Schrodinger. No, that's true. Same, th same thing with the Schrodinger equation, right? If I start off with the wave packet with the Schrodinger equation, it's always going to spread out to infinity. But the centroid obeys uh, the, the the expectation value obeys um, uh, Newton's laws. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm not totally sure. I mean, so I'm, I'm saying that this approach doesn't capture that. I'm going to give you another approach that does. Um, okay, and so what I would like to do is to find a mathematically precise and true assertion um, that combines what I take to be the benefits of each of these approaches, but avoids the, the pitfalls. So here's how that goes. Um, I'm going to define a notion called tracking, which is going to capture a sense in which some matter fields might tend to move along a curve for a while. Okay, and this is, I mean, I, I take it that what I'm doing here is giving a very general characterization of what you might take to be the centroid, as you like, behavior of wave packet-like <laughs> solutions to any equation you like. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to suppose that we have some collection of smooth fields TAD that satisfy the dominant energy condition. These are smooth fields, but they just satisfy the dominant energy condition in the normal sense on some fixed space time energy. Um, each of these fields defines a distribution. Okay, so this is a standard thing. You give me any uh, smooth test function, I can define the action of the smooth field on that test function simply by integrating. Um, test functions have compact support, so this integral is always finite. Everything is nice. We'll say that this collection of smooth fields tracks a time-like curve. If it's the case that for every smooth test field that satisfies the dual energy condition near gamma, which satisfies an additional technical condition, um, there's a field TAB in C such that the action of T on X is strictly positive. Okay, so what does that tracking condition mean? Here's the idea. What I would like to do is capture the idea that there's more stuff, more stress energy near the curve than there is far away from the curve. The way that I'm going to do that is by using um, test fields that satisfy the dual energy condition to measure how much stress energy is located in a given region. The idea is that since the TAB fields all satisfy the dominant energy condition, they always give positive results when acting on test functions that have that satisfy the dual dominant energy condition. And so I'm always going to get some positive number when acting on those things. That gives me all infinitely many different measures of how much stuff is located in the region where that thing is supported. And so consider now, in particular, test fields Z that satisfy the dual energy condition and Y that satisfy the dual energy condition. Then X, defined as Z minus Y, will be the sort of thing that satisfies the dual energy condition near the curve but doesn't satisfy it somewhat farther from the curve. And so the stress energy is such that its action on X is positive. That tells me that the amount of T near the curve, as measured by Z, must be greater than the amount of T far from the curve, as measured by Y. And if this holds for all X that are satisfied the dual energy condition near the curve, then it follows that I can always find in my collection some TAB which is as much more concentrated near the curve, as far from the curve, as I like. So this captures the sense in which I've got some collection of Ts. They might be solutions to some hyperbolic system. Um, and they are going to have the property that I could always find in that collection someone who, for as long as I like, not forever, but for as long as I like, along some compact segment of the curve, stays near the curve to whatever degree I like. And so you can think of this as the claim that I have solutions which have the feature that the distribution can be made, like the distribution not in the this sense, the distribution in the sense of, you know, like a bell curve or whatever, um, or a, a, a Gaussian, um, can be squished down as much as I like near the curve. Um, and it'll have tails, and it'll spread out eventually, but for as long as I like, as close to the curve as I like, I can, I can make the solution go that way. We then get this theorem. Suppose that I have a space-time, suppose I have a time-like curve therein, and I have a collection of symmetric fields, each satisfying the dominant energy condition that tracks gamma. Suppose that each of these fields is conserved with divergence free. Then there's a sequence of fields in the collection, each of which is some 
or so there's a sequence of fields which I can sort of renormalize if I like, um, that converges in the sense of distributions to the delta function distribution supported on the set. So what I'm getting here, I don't have this delta function in my collection. What I'm showing though is that any collection that tracks the curve and is con all members of which are conserved approximates the delta function as well as I like. So this sort of allows me to give a kind of justification for using the distributional approach that um, uh, doesn't require me to, in the first place, choose some sequence that converges to that distribution. I'm saying that if you give me this collection, I always get some sequence that approximates that distribution. And of course, it follows then that the curve must be a GOD set. Um, it also follows that, in fact, this is the only limit point of sequences of fields that approach the curve that satisfy these other conditions. And so there's some sense in which what we're showing is kind of universal property of collections of fields that track <coughs> the curve. They all approximate precisely this distribution if they satisfy the dominant energy condition and are divergence free. And so you can show a similar thing for null curves. So in the limit, is it a delta function? In the limit, it's a delta function. Because yeah. Yeah. Just but it's a universal limit. limit. Yeah, and you right. just constructed the sequence that finally gives you the delta function. Yeah, that's exactly okay. right. And you're showing that that delta function is, in some sense, the unique limit okay. of all possible sequences, nets, whatever collections that you like that satisfy these weak conditions. But you've come back to that. I've come back first, to the first idea. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but I come back to the first idea in a way that makes essential use of the second idea. Um, now, I just want to observe, if a collection of conserved fields satisfying the dominant energy condition tracks the curve, then the curve must be time-like or null. So we've also built in here that it's got to be a time-like or null curve. Um, in the same way, incidentally, that we've built in that it ends up uh, being order zero via the energy condition. Okay. And so the upshot is that any family of bodies that collapses down in size in an appropriate way must converge to the energy momentum representing a point particle of the distribution. I think I've made these points already. Um, I just want to observe that what I've said captures and indeed generalizes the Garrosh Yang results. So this is just a here's an example of the sort of collection that tracks a curve. Suppose that C is a collection such that for every neighborhood O of the curve, <laughs> I can construct a symmetric non-vanishing divergence-free TAB that satisfies the dominant energy condition and vanishes outside of O. Then it tracks the curve gamma, and it follows that gamma must be a GOD set. And so this is a kind of a special case now. This was exactly the garrosh yang setup that I started with. And you can do the ehlers garrosh the one that allows for back reaction in a very similar way. And so again, this is generalizing that. Okay. Now, I just want to observe there are two ways in which we've extended the curve first result. Um, one is that it turns out that we can um, now link it to forced motion. And so we can uh, prove things like the Lorentz force law, if you like. Um, I'm going to, for time reasons, move on. But the basic picture is I consider a collection not just of TABs, but of Ts and Js. The T satisfy a dominant energy condition, and there's a certain sense in which the charge current density associated with each of my bodies uh, is bounded, um, and what that does is it rules out various dipole and higher moments in the limit, because of course if you, you can consider dipoles in the limit if you like, but you're not going to get Lorentz force motion, and so this gives you a way of controlling that. It wasn't obvious how to do in the garrosh yang setup. And then you get a theorem that can be interpreted as capturing Lorentz force motion using precisely the same setup. And this can be generalized, you can do whatever kind of force motion you like. Um, I also want to point out that the theorems strengthen the consequent, but they also weaken the premises. And so this allows you to apply these methods to collections of hyperbolic of solutions to a hyperbolic system, such as Maxwell's equation. So now it'll be the case that solutions to Maxwell's equations will track a curve, even though they aren't supported in tubes forever, um, because they can be supported as much as you like near the curve for as long as you can. Um, Um, and so, 
It follows just from Maxwell's equations themselves that every element, that every solution to Maxwell's equations is automatically divergence free and automatically satisfies the dominant energy condition. And it then follows also that um, C can only track time-like and null geodesic. That was a result that I noted before. And then finally, one can prove that C tracks all null geodesics and tracks no time-like geodesics. Now, the arguments to show this sort of result involve, in some sense, the kind of asymptotic expansion that has been discussed already a little bit. Um, you can also, uh, so for the Klein-Gordon case, we give an argument that involves bounding energy integrals, the sort of methods that one often encounters in hyperbolic systems theory. Um, but the point is that you can now, you can prove results about collections of solutions to some hyperbolic system that have the consequence that those solutions, um, their associated stress energies, which are of course all defined for the smooth solutions, always track time-like curves or time-like and null curves, or I'm sorry, time-like geodesics or time-like and null geodesics. And then it follows that any small body limit you can construct from such solutions, no matter, in some sense, no matter how you construct that limit, um, will always converge to the delta function behavior. Um, and in particular, this captures as an immediate consequence the geometric optics uh, uh, claim. Okay. And you can do similar things. You can show that um, for real Klein Gordon fields, they're going to follow null geodesics or time like geodesics, um, depending on what collection of solutions you consider. I can talk about that if people like. But for complex Klein Gordon fields, you can get Lorentz force motion uh, and so on. Okay. Now, let me very briefly say how I take all of this to relate to the <coughs> philosophical question about what it means to talk about space time geometry in the beginning. Um, recall that. I made this remark that inertial structure encapsulated by the geodesic principle provides a kind of link between motion and physical geometry. Um, it does so by identifying a geometrically privileged class of curves with a physically privileged class of curves, or a, a class of motions associated with a certain class of bodies. And it gives a kind of physical significance to the notion of geodesy as a geometrical motion. And as I noted, conversely, you can show that there's a certain sense in which precisely that connection, that information about which curves are the, the physically privileged ones, allows you to reconstruct what the space-time metric must be. And so we see this strong link between geodesic principle and physical geometry. Um, but you might have been dissatisfied by that as a general matter because the geodesic principle concerns a kind of entity that in some sense is physically impossible by the lights of general relativity. And so what I want to suggest is that tracking allows us to state this link between motion and physical geometry in a different way. Tracking allows us to state something like the geodesic principle in a way that refers only to matter field equations to some hyperbolic systems on space time. And so here's a kind of restatement of the geodesic principle. Energy momentum tensors associated with solutions to source-free matter-field equations track only time-like or null geodesics. Okay, and the source-free here is to capture the idea that we've got no interactions. Um, and the idea here is that physically reasonable matter should follow curves. You need to capture the sense in which they're going to follow curves. I'm suggesting that tracking allows us to say that without invoking the problematic notion of point particles. Okay, and, and as I say, in this new form, the geodesic principle is almost a theorem, just as stated. There's nothing fancy that needs to happen further. Um, and it's going to hold for any system of field equations whenever the energy momentum tensors associated with source-free solutions are divergence-free with respect to the space-time derivative operator and satisfy the dominant energy condition. And so I remember I began by saying that there's you know, now a question of what needs to be true of matter field equations for it to be the case that in a small body limit, they're going to do the sorts of things that they need to do in order for us to sort of employ this particular interpretation of the physical significance of space-time geometry. And it looks as if the answer is, well, matter has to satisfy equations whose solutions are always divergence-free whenever they're on shell and satisfy the dominant energy condition. In fact, this, Number one, follows for a wide class of physical fields that one can consider that are, whose 
equations of motion are derived from an action principle. You're going to get the TAB as divergence free from that more or less automatically. But now there's an interesting question, which is, um, can we say something about when or why we expect the dominant energy condition to be satisfied? Of course, it is satisfied for many fields of interest, and it's not satisfied for some other fields that you can consider writing down, such as Dirac fields. get both time-like and null geodesics out of this. And how is that, is that distinction being made in the form of your TABs? Uh, so which, which yeah. curves you get? Yeah, which one do you get and how yeah. is that determined? Um, so that's determined by looking at the solutions to the differential equation you're interested in and showing whether you can construct, you know, do the kinds of expansions or the kinds of energy integral arguments that one does in considering the subject, figure out sort of what kinds of curves you can kind of get close to. Um, one striking result is that the Klein-Gordon equation doesn't actually track time-like curves if you just consider it fixed M. In order to get the Klein-Gordon equation to track time-like curves, you have to consider solutions not for fixed M, but for all M. And mass increases as you sort of get smaller and smaller. And that you, physically this makes sense because M, the parameter that appears in the Klein-Gordon equation, um, doesn't tell you anything about the total mass associated with a solution to the Klein-Gordon equation. For that, you need to integrate over some region of space. It's the sort of a parameter that moderates that. Um, and so if you've got a fixed M parameter in your Klein-Gordon equation, you consider smaller and smaller solutions, the integrated mass is going to get smaller and smaller, and the thing is going to try to go faster and faster. So your sequence would be a sequence of Changing M. Changing, yeah, higher and higher frequency, higher and higher mass, those are going to increase together to get down. And to get your null geodesic, what would your sequence be? Uh, Zero mass. Fixed mass, any fixed any mass. Any fixed mass will give you High frequency will give you null geodesic. Yeah, okay. yeah. I see, okay. Yeah, so um, it's not clear to me that one can have a uh, self-consistent solution for a, a delta particle, a delta function initial data for Einstein's equation in the first place. I think there are good reasons to think you can't do that. Uh, and so the way that I would think about it is consider initial... Well, I can, instead of delta function, I take a small ball there and move a small open set there and fill it with some fluid or uh, fill it with something. And then you watch this small ball, how it changes. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, no, for extended matter, it could do anything. And so the curious thing is how to understand um, why you would expect, or if you should, I argue you should, why you would expect that as you get smaller and smaller bodies, they're going to tend to follow uh, GAD6 better and better. Wouldn't we just think that that needle could do something on what Yao yeah, was suggesting? And we take some finite region that we would expect that the corrections to the motion would be suppressed by the dimensional combination of the size of the object with the scale of the curvature, divided by the scale of the curvature. And, and uh, so two so things. One is yes, I I so would if expect that. Is flat over the region of where the particle lives. Yeah. So yes, I would expect that, um, and indeed it is true. So I, I, I take it that, that you might think that there's some work to be done to get from sort of what you expect to establishing it in sort of a precise mathematical way, and that's what you're getting to do. Um, one thing to say, though, is that, of course, uh, whether or not that's true is going to depend on things like whether or not you have complex multipole moments and whether or not the particle is going to be spinning. Part of what's happening here is 
we're showing that that sort of thing turns out to be ruled out in the small body limit by the dominant energy condition. And so a sort of surprisingly simple constraint is uh, mm -hmm. limiting how, for instance, rotational degrees of freedom can lead to deviation from geodesic motion as you shrink things down. If you wanted spin, you would basically you would need to converge to uh, some higher order distribution on the curve. It would be a derivative of a delta function, for instance. And you mean for the back end? No, I just mean I mean so spinning bodies and you know spinning point it particles. Just parallel to any point that spin along the curve. But it wouldn't follow geodesic. Spinning particle, you start with a geodesic and then you parallel transport the spin. That's what that's what Shep does when he when he when he when he um, looks at uh, si signals from. But he keeps it along a geodesic. I mean, they, have, they do the ray tracing along null geodesics, and for them, it's polarization. Which is for a null for a null geodesic. For photons, for photons, it's yeah. different than for massive bodies. Well, but isn't it still parallel transport along massive bodies? So, so a spinning massive body on the, in the point particle limit generally should not follow a time like geodesic. Well, why not? The spin, the spin is should not follow a time like geodesic. Yeah, if you, I mean, so there, there's a, a spin curvature coupling that you can get from that. You know. Isn't that subleading? Uh, so, I mean, I I don't. Um, I'm reporting what the what people say. I mean, we couldn't get the results in the case where we see, we couldn't get geodesic motion in the case where you have uh, spin, and in well, the literature, in many the case, people argue that you don't. Proton, you shouldn't. It's some it's some it's some right there's neutron in but it's some in some order they follow geodesics and the spin of the neutron is parallel transported along the. Yes. Okay, but consider though that. The neutron itself has some, you know, classically has some non-zero radius, presumably, and it's right. got some rotational degrees of freedom. Than the That's right, and so, so uh, the question is, can you shrink down the neutron all the way in such a way that its angular momentum remains constant yeah, and it still follows a time-like geodesic? And the claim there is, is no. a spin in quantum mechanics. Uh, you wouldn't think of it as spinning, but it's actually a spin. Yeah, and that's and so the claim is that in Point particles with intrinsic angular momentum don't follow time like geodesic. But this isn't my result, this is an old thing. <coughs> uh, the, uh, I can find the name, it's two Romanian names. It's, uh, no, it's textbook yeah. It's textbook stuff, yeah, this is. I never heard this. Textbook stuff is always right. No, the pro, the well, I, I mean, maybe it's the, wrong. The, and, uh, is, you know, the proton is different because the proton, the proton has an electric field that extends to infinity, and so it's not localized. That's, the proton is different, but the neutron that has no charge. Yeah, so this is. I mean, I, I thought it would be just localized, and there, there shouldn't be any effect. Well, I'd be happy to share the uh, the classic papers on this. Maybe they're wrong, but okay. we couldn't contradict question. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <coughs> so, so Jim will be around. Yeah. Jim will be around later today. Um, absolutely. Good. Thank you. <laughs> what are philosophers stars? <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> our speakers uh, are uh, Professor Laura Reutcher from the University of Michigan. She's a professor of philosophy there and holds a PhD uh, in philosophy from the University of Pittsburgh and prior to that did a BPhil from Oxford in philosophy. Uh, she works in uh, various issues in the philosophy of physics and the philosophy of science, in particular the foundations of physical theories and in particular quantum theory has interest in Feminist philosophy as well, uh, as well as logic. Yes. Um, and then I'll also point out Professor Gordon Bellop, who's sitting right there. Thank you for raising your hands. <laughs> uh, so he'll be giving a talk, uh, he'll be uh, following on from Professor Reutcher, and he's a professor of philosophy at the University of Michigan as well. He holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Pittsburgh.
sorry, then prior to that did uh, graduate work at the University of Toronto uh, as well. And he uh, works in philosophy of physics and philosophy of science and metaphysics, epistemology, all the good stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, some of the, the themes of his papers include inter-theoretic relations in physics and symmetry principles from all points of view, as well as confirmation and non-determination. And they're going to tell us a lovely title, and it may have been almost entirely the abstract theoretical. Uh, why philosophers would care about one. <laughs> Thanks, Faraz. I want to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to give this extremely brief talk. Um, what I'm going to try to address is yeah, this question, why philosophers star, should care about black holes. And core philosophers star, well, I'm going to break it to you. The philosophers you've seen aren't a representative sample of philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> They're hothouse flowers, and many of them have advanced degrees in math and science, fluency, uh, differential geometry. Perhaps a predilection to care about pieces of physics or applied mathematics just because they are physics or applied mathematics. I want to talk about why garden variety philosophers should care about black holes, what garden variety philosophers are innocent of mathematical physics. And my strategy is going to be uh, to talk about questions garden variety philosophers, because that's, that's what they That's about right. garden variety philosophers. <laughs> talk, about, <laughs> talk about questions they care about already. Talk, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how they express that care. And then I'm going to suggest the questions get more interesting and the methods get deeper, get stronger, if garden variety philosophers consider black holes, even the most simple presentation of classical black holes. And black holes are synecdoche for a whole range of concrete examples from the history of the presence of, the presence of physics. Um, Wait, what's the answer to the question on the book cover? <laughs> yeah, you have to read the book. <laughs> Um, yeah, so here's one question garden variety philosophers care about. I'm going to motivate it with a quote from Vintner and, uh, and collaborators. Uh, um, if one of these ever thinks he's a physics or stamp collecting genre of quotes, uh, there's a sharp <laughs> distinction, they say, between two kinds of in initial conditions, sort of boring accidents, basically addresses and laws of nature. Uh, physicists not interested in initial conditions, but use their study to stamp collectors. Um, it's the laws of nature that should concern physicists, uh, and it's concerned with laws of nature uh, that helps inform our understanding of symmetry and invariance. So the laws of nature are very important to Wigner and collaborators, also very interesting to philosophers. Uh, very standard philosophical question is, what is a law of physics? And laws, things that govern goings on in the universe, that's an account of laws that's not even covertly metaphorical. Governance, laws, institutions are human constructs. So saying, calling something a law of physics and thinking of it as something governing and going on in the physical world isn't a sharp account of it. So philosophers go looking for sharper accounts. They go looking to deliver on the metaphor. And something a lot of garden variety philosophers either agree to or are willing to take as a kind of starting point is that laws of nature are exceptional regularities. They're universal regularities. They're patterns that hold everywhere and always. But being philosophers, having agreed to that much, there's lots of things they disagree about. This is garden variety philosophers. One thing they disagree about is, is universality enough? Is there something more we should demand of universal regularity in order to regard it as a law, as falling on the interesting side, a sharp distinction? And there's many, many examples of uh, how to motivate uh, the thought there might be a distinction, like in boxes. There's no gold spheres 100 kilometers um, in uh, diameter in the universe, neither are there any uranium spheres, but those seem like regularities that hold for very different sorts of reasons. Uh, another thing garden variety philosophers uh, disagree about concerning laws. Uh, concerns relationships between the laws of the universe and what's going on in that universe. So uh, one sort of question you might have is whether fixing all the physical facts, fixing the history of the universe, fixes what its laws are or whether it's sort of possible, consistent with the nature of physics and the concept of law, for there to be two descriptively identical universes that are governed by different laws. Um, uh, people who are known in philosophy as empiricists are sort of committed to thinking fixing the physical facts fixes the law. People who think there's something woozier going on with laws aren't always uh, bound to that uh, uh, presupposition. But we have another kind of thing philosophers disagree about. Can there be uninstantiated can something be a law of the universe when it has no instances? So consider a universe consisting of a single point mass. Does it make sense to say that 
obeyed a lot of gravity. Another thing garden variety philosophers worry about is, uh, are physical laws necessary? Do the laws of physics have to be the way they are? Uh, this seems like a really weird question to anybody who knows anything about the history of physics. It seems totally conceivable that the physical world could have been the way Newton said it was, rather than the way he, uh, we think of it now. But philosophers get exercised about this. So here's a kind of agenda of questions philosophers have, garden variety philosophers about laws of physics. Isn't there a clear difference between laws uh, of society and laws of physics in the sense that you can break the law of society? Mm, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's true. You can't break the laws of physics. Yeah, um, and that illustrates that it's just a metaphor, the laws of society. So all the more reason to try to spell out the odd way it is. And we can have the method of spelling out what it is pose some questions. It's a caricature of philosophical method in the sense that the following snapshot sort of emphasizes some features in the philosophical landscape and sort of leaves others out. Um, but here's a kind of consideration philosophers events for uh, addressing questions about the relationship between what's happening in the universe and what its laws are. Um, consider, this is, I think, an example from a philosopher called Michael Tooley, a world with 10 kinds of particles and all the possible pairs of particle interactions there are happen except for what, what, between two sorts of particles. Two of them never interact. Two sorts of particles ne never interact. So you mean just as a, just, just as a matter of happenstance? Just as a matter of happenstance, or, matter, or we never observe them interact. It doesn't really matter. Um, no, yeah, as a ha matter of happenstance, they never, inter uh, they never interact. The description of the universe just reveals they never interact. Could there be a law governing the interaction of those particles? If so, what would it be? How could the facts of the history of this universe determine what the law is? So it interacts with the question of whether there are uninstantiated laws whether descriptively identical universes could uh, diverge in their laws. Um, the question of whether the laws of nature are necessary, whether the laws of nature could have been different. Here's like a little piece of a dialogue about that uh, that goes on in the literature. Um, there are people, let's call them necessitarian garden variety philosophers, who say the laws of physics couldn't be different. They said something like <coughs> the following. Given that the physical properties are what they are, the laws have to be what they are. And their opponents reply, well, that's crazy. Um, if, suppose the laws of nature are Newtonian. Still, it seems totally possible that F equals MA might not have been true. It seems there's a possible world someplace where. Well, actually, there are people, scientists claiming that that's the case, uh, mod, uh, modifying Newtonian dynamics. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so yeah, they, these guys are talking about some possibility. Uh, right. You're crazy if you're ruling out that possibility. What the necessitarians, the philosophers who think laws of nature are necessary, reply is, well, in this case, you're not just modifying Newton's law. You're modifying what properties obtain in the world you're talking about. But if you got some object that doesn't uh, obey Newton's second law, that object doesn't have mass. It just has a mass-like property called schmass. And so this possible world you're thinking of isn't a counterexample to the claim that every way the properties of our world are instantiated, so too are the laws of our world upheld. It's an example of a different sort of um, compendium of law. Can I ask a law? question? I, yeah. I don't want to derail things, but it's very interesting. The first one up there, as a physicist, our, our, our job is always to look for things that may not have happened before. I mean, people didn't think of dark energy mm -hmm. right, until just yeah. recently, in which we found the empirical evidence yeah. for it. So I'm not sure what you mean by never. In that sentence. Yeah, let me say uh, the examples of arguments and considerations throughout, uh, I'm not endorsing, I'm <laughs> exhibiting them. So, this is, yeah, let me just say this, uh, um, uh, emphasize that these are examples of how garden variety philosophers go after the question of what laws of nature are. And my point's going to be they're in, the engagement of garden variety philosophers with the question of what laws of nature are becomes a lot richer if they pay attention to what happens in physics, mm -hmm. including attention to, and I'll get this there at the end, which should happen pretty quickly, including attention to the fact that physics is still under construction. Um, but this is just to give you a flavor of how dialogue about laws of nature unfolds in the garden variety philosophical literature to lay the groundwork for making the claim, but it shouldn't be surprising at this point that it would be a more interesting, substantial dialogue if it took into account examples from physics rather than just armchair examples. Oh, yeah. But why are these, at least at first, sorry, I'm but why, why, why do these job as philosophers, not physicists? I mean, surely you have to, just more generally, understanding the all possible self-consistent laws. I mean, you, you need to know a lot of physics to answer that. 
question and it's a well-defined question with an answer. Doesn't that make it sort of? Um, I think it makes it a consideration of the space of possible physics. I take it that physics is in the first instance interested in describing the laws of our universe, and it might be one strategy for getting there, is considering what possible laws well, but are. But we don't know the laws yet. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's certainly the kind of thing that we do all the time. Abs ab yeah, yeah. And that's going to be part of why I think that it's useful for philosophers who care about what a law of nature is to, instead of sitting around thinking about universes where we know there's ten particles and imagine that two sort ten kinds of particles and imagining that two of, of those kinds never interact, to look at like the history and present of physics and uh, see their consideration of what makes a physical law a physical law with uh, examples drawn, drawn from physics. Um, but yeah, part of what's implicit here is uh, there's an overlap of concern. Like Aristotle, uh, his metaphysics, he called the science of being qua being. You can translate that into the investigation of the space of all possible physical theories. Uh, that's the sort of metaphysical question par excellence from the outset. Doesn't mean it's a question that's not useful, important, set, central for physicists to consider. It also doesn't mean people trained as physicists might not be even better at considering that kind of question than philosophers. Okay. Uh, and Kant famously gave a series of considerations based on his conception of what it takes for experience to be possible that issued in conclusions like space is Euclidean, every event has a cause, matter is conserved. Um, uh, these things should be laws. Uh, so what are the philosophical methods? They're sort of armchair reflection. Sometimes armchair reflection issuing in principles that the subsequent history of physics overturns uh, and reporting on the outcomes of thought experiments uh, sort of in a compelling and uh, uh, persuasive, persuasive way. But another way to get at the question of laws, the garden variety philosopher's method is to concoct problematic cases and sort them into things that are laws and things that aren't laws. Uh, that, and uh, uh, that method um, presupposes that the sort of sharp distinction evinced in the Wigner quote um, is a good way to think of the relationship between laws and, uh, and initial conditions. Um, there's a sharp distinction between laws and accidents, a sharp distinction that's non-contextual, that's the same everywhere you draw it, uh, and never a matter of degree, a distinct, distinction of kind. But another way you can think of problematic cases, test cases, puzzling cases, um, is as signs that the presuppositions guiding your account of law as something sharply distinct from initial conditions um, might be going awry that uh, uh, there might be more texture in physical laws than uh, the presuppositions of philosophical accounts uh, uh, yeah, uh, allow the expression of. And sort of all over physics, there are examples of things that seem to be cases of uh, gradation in law-likeness, or cases where it's not so clear there's a sharp distinction between uh, initial conditions and laws the way function in Bohmian mechanics, and on the one hand to be an initial condition, but the other hand to play a dynamical law. Um, the effective theory framework, laws of an effective theory, they don't hold everywhere and always, they break down at high energies. Uh, mm -hmm. Spring theoretic landscapes, the way of thinking about laws of nature, whether something environmental about them. And then what I want to talk about quickly, singularities and black holes. So laws of physics. Are the Einstein field equation laws of physics? And everybody's seen this quote, uh, of the reports Einstein had a horror of singularities. Uh, uh, they're intolerable. A singular region represents a breakdown of the postulated laws of nature. Um, so singularities are regions of space-time when an adult will be, where the field equations break down. Another way of putting it is that there are wins and wares where the Einstein field equations don't hold. Well, if there's wins and wares where the Einstein field equations don't hold, they sort of fail to exhibit the property you think laws have, universality, holding everywhere and always. Uh, so quick, dirty argument, the Einstein field equations turn out not to be laws of singular space-time, and maybe they're thereby disqualified from being laws at, at all. Okay, again, not endorsing this argument, just showing what kind of considerations it mobilizes. Um, you know, the kind of standard escape hatch it's to claim about something at the point of space-time. Uh, in order to be at the point of space-time, you've got to be such that you admit the definition of a metric tensor, maybe stress energy field. So space-time singularities aren't really wins and wares. They're not points of space-time. And so the Einstein field equations hold everywhere and always, after all. Uh, kind of escape hatch, some observations about it. 
There's a way this escape hatch echoes the mass and schmass maneuver. It seems like a really cheap route to lawhood for any law to claim that any region where it doesn't hold that that's not really a region of physical space. Sort of a quick aside. But another is that uh, this sort of maneuver points out ways the notion of law is more complicated, more nuanced than it might have seemed at the outset, than it might have seemed when considered from the armchair. Um, one thing that points out is that everywhere and always, what accounts for the fixed and universal isn't a free theoretic notion. That the physical theories we're talking about sometimes help supply, help frame an account of what it is to be an element of, of physical reality. Uh, and so he can't explicate what a law of physics is without some sort of account of what everywhere and always is, without some sort of account of universality. He can't explicate what a law of physics is without re presupposing something, presupposing something that isn't uh, just, just mathematics. Um, and if that's true, it seems only fair to index your verdicts about what's a law and what's not to your presuppositions. And then because some sets of, some sets of presuppositions can be stronger than weaker than others, you can get the result that what's a law indexed to presuppositions that are stronger than weaker than others is also a matter of degree. And you can get the result that uh, laws are context sensitive if appropriate presuppositions about what counts as universality vary with context of inquiry application, so on and so on and so on. So this is sort of complicating, but in a way that conforms to the complexity of physical practice, assumptions about lawhood being a very clean business and character of an acute sentence in sort of context independent way. Uh, and they're doing a sharp distinction between uh, Laws and initial conditions. Another, finally, black holes. Another, um, uh, another response to, to singularities is to contain them. The cosmic censorship hypothesis that every singularity that threatens to disrupt the business of physics comes close to an event horizon. Uh, so, uh, beyond its event horizon, a singularity doesn't disrupt physics. Um, another response to the threat. And the thing I want to observe about this response is it shifts the question at hand from what laws are to what law 